everybody. Good afternoon. We're just waiting for everyone to come in. Brilliant to see so many people coming in. 160 and counting at the minute. We'll just wait for that number to tick up and then I'll get started. Okay, so welcome everybody to the webinar today. Um, my name is Sally Hogg and I'm the coordinator and the chair of the First 1001 Days Movement. We're a, an alliance of nearly 200 charities from across the UK, and we exist to challenge and support decision makers to do more to invest in babies and young children's development and support for their families during the period from conception to two. And as part of that, a key theme of our work is sharing evidence and solutions about what works. And um, so we were really delighted when Paul and the team at Pedal approached us to run this um, webinar today. Um, so. I'm not going to spend very long talking because we've got some fantastic speakers and um, so huge thanks to Mike who is going to present to us uh, the findings from the FMP trial, Paul who's going to talk to us about the Healthy Start Happy Start trial and then we've got a brilliant set panel um, who are going to talk a little bit about what that means and what we can take from the findings of those trials um, to inform practice for babies across the UK um, and there will be a chance um, for Q&A at two points today. So you can put your Q&A into, um, through the Zoom function. There'll be a pause at the end of um, Mike and Paul's presentations where you can ask any factual questions about what they've said. Um, and then throughout the panel discussion, please do put your thoughts and questions to the panel to feed into that. So um, without further ado, I want to uh, introduce Professor Mike Robling to talk about the results of the FMP trial. Over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start sharing my screen. Um, and hopefully people can see that. Yeah, great, thank you. So uh, firstly, thank you for the invitation to uh, talk today. Um, thank you, Paul and, and Sally and others. Um, and I'm really pleased to provide this update on, on work we've been running from Cardiff for quite a number of years, evaluating um, a specialist home visiting programme called the Family Nurse Partnership. Um, I'm presenting really on behalf of quite a large team of people who were involved both in the original trial, which was called Building Blocks, and also uh, a, the substantive follow-on study called Building Blocks 2. Um, and I'm really pleased that we've got the panel who, who may be, have a, a particular interest in, in uh, as Sally says, looking at how these um, findings might inform practice. So our, our focus really has been on children of teenage mothers who are more likely to um, be born at, at a lower birth weight, who are more likely not to be breastfed, to have a greater uh, likelihood of risk of accidents and early death, and in the longer term to do worse educationally and experience greater emotional and behavioral problems. Um, they're also more likely to become teenage mothers and teenage parents themselves and thereby sort of continuing the cycle of um, a disadvantage. So that's really the population context that we're addressing in, in, our, in our work. And um, uh, there are, a range of options available to support families in these circumstances and um, one particular scheme uh, was adopted by the um, Department of uh, Health in England to, to support uh, young mothers and uh, this was the Nurse Family Partnership which was developed originally uh, in the United States and I'll say a little bit about the programme and the first trial just to provide some context for the results I'm going to present on the follow-on study, the Building Blocks 2 study. Um, the, family nurse, the Nurse Family Partnership, as it was known in the US, um, is a reproducible and heavily manualized program um, which is aiming to prevent, it's a preventative program for vulnerable first-time mothers. It has a sound theoretical basis which has evolved over the years 
uh, and it provides a highly manualized uh, schedule of visits which are implemented by specially recruited and trained family nurses. In the, uh, at the inception of the trial and the introduction of the family nurse partnership in England, um, uh, up to 64 um, home visits were being offered um, from the time the women recruited um, as close as possible to the beginning of the second trimester uh, up until uh, children are age, are age two. So it's quite, a, quite an intensive and a resource intensive intervention. Um, and this models the and matches the, the, the approach that was taken in, in the United States uh, when it was, uh, where it was originally trialled. Um, the overall, overarching aim, of course, is therefore to transform the lives of uh, young mothers and their families. So this, this was a programme that came to England and uh, more broadly to the UK with a, a strong evidence base, um, primarily in the North American setting. So this is a programme of work that, has, has, that goes back uh, 40 years and comprises three substantive trials. The first of which was initiated in, in the late 70s in Elmira in New York State. And then two subsequent trials have um, attended to different foci in terms of populations or, or, or the comparator. Um, and uh, you, you can see the numbers of participants involved and a little bit about the, the context within which those, um, uh, those trials were undertaken. And uh, the, the developers of the programme and the unit who were responsible for um, managing the programme have looked for where there has been reproducible evidence uh, in, in more than one of these trials. So there's, they've built, a, they've accumulated a, a body of evidence where there's um, a pattern of repetition of um, positive findings. And I think that's really the starting point for our journey in the UK when we began the evaluation of FNP. So in 2008, it was, we, we initiated um, uh, the, the Building Blocks trial. This was a pragmatic trial. This was essentially asking um, how effective is this intervention when deployed in normal practice or alongside normal practice in England. Um, and we were fortunate to work um, from the very start with the, the Family Nurse Partnership uh, national team and local leaders to help set up the trials. Um, and the trial was an open, uh, individually randomized controlled trial. Um, and we recruited uh, just over 1600 uh, women into that study who were themselves um, first time teenage mothers uh, who could be recruited um, uh, sufficiently early in pregnancy so that they could then receive the program during pregnancy and then into um, infancy into toddlerhood phases. Um, the, the entry criteria and therefore the, the, the women who took part in the, both the original trial and our follow-on study uh, were intentionally kept as broad as possible and matched those of the programme. So we weren't looking to exclude unnecessarily uh, women who could take part in the trial uh, because we really wanted as um, generalizable uh, findings as possible. Um, we allocated women either to receive um, uh, home visits from an FNP nurse or to, uh, in addition to usually provided health and social care or to um, uh, usually provided health and social care services alone. So that's really the comparison that we're making. And I think it's worth remembering that when we think about how these results fit into the uh, broader context of findings uh, where this intervention has been evaluated in the US, where really that control arm was quite minimal in terms of what women might have received. Uh, and after taking informed consent, we actually had a mixed model of data collection whereby we um, used interviews with, with mothers um, throughout the two and a half year um, follow-up period, as well as accessing routine health and um, uh, social care data. When we reported on the original trial in 2015, we found um, little evidence for differences on uh, the four primary outcomes that we had selected at that stage, which were quite focused on maternal outcomes um, 
and included but included birth weight and um, um, uh, emergency uh, admissions uh, to uh, emergency attendance admissions for for children um, and for some other sort of key policy outcomes so we were I think slightly disappointed that um, at that stage we were unable to demonstrate major differences between the two study arms however for some of the secondary outcomes that we looked at there was there was some emerging evidence of difference between the two study two study arms and I've listed there uh, what those uh, what some of those comprised um, intention to breastfeed um, maternally reported cognitive delays and language delays at different stages of follow-up so there was some indication that there may be some differences which actually might continue to be um, uh, evidence in the longer term so uh, we that was that was part of our um, I guess motivation for continuing to follow the same cohort over a longer period of time so we followed in the trial children and families up until the age two, age two and then in the subsequent study uh, we were looking to uh, take that on uh, quite a bit further so in the building blocks uh, two trial, we um, we asked the question um, uh, whether uh, we could detect any uh, benefit in terms of maltreatment outcomes, and this was the this was the funding call's primary focus. That's why it's in the headline figure here. But we took advantage of the data sets that we were going to be using to actually broaden the scope of the inquiry uh, to include um, both health and uh, educational outcomes. And this trial, were, sorry, this um, and this study used exclusively administrative data available from a variety of different sources. So um, we were not going back to families, uh, although we had some ambition to do so, but we were funded to really uh, focus on administrative data sources. So it was a data linkage study which followed the same families up until age seven. Um, and these were all those families who were exiting from the building blocks trial. And you can see in terms of successful data linkage, we, we, um, we had over 1,500 children who, for whom we were able to link back to health records, as well as um, about the same number who we were able to link to both educational and social care records. So in this study, we, we, are, we looked at the, the extent to which the programme benefits could be uh, evidence uh, in terms of um, service measures of maltreatment, for example, whether children were ever referred to social services whether they were assessed as being in need uh, etc um, indicators of intermediate programming impact uh, principally whether um, whether mothers had subsequent pregnancies uh, and also um, evidence related to child health developmental and educational outcomes and to do this we were able to draw on both the trial data that we we captured and then add to that um, health data supplied by NHS Digital in England and educational social care data provided by the National People Database. And um, this, this scary looking slide really describes the, the data model that we had to use in this data link study. Um, and this took a bit of working out how we would do this, but essentially all of the data that we accumulated both in the original trial and in the subsequent follow-on study ended up in a secure data safe haven which we access remotely and that provided assurances in relation to things like uh, data security um, um, and patient uh, or participant confidentiality so we had to really work out how we would do the study um, in a way that hadn't been done previously to exploit the, the potential benefit of the different data sources in terms of results, I'm going to just focus on maybe some highlight areas, um, recognising that there were other outcomes that we, we evaluated. And this first slide, first of three slides, looks at um, <clears throat> the experience of um, children in relation to their exposure and uh, to social services. Firstly, whether children at any point in follow up from the point they were recruited to the trial up until age seven, were assessed, were referred to uh, social services and assessed as a need. And we can see there from the figures that uh, we, for, for the FNP arm and the usual care arm, that there was, um, there was a minimal difference between the two arms in, in terms of the numbers of children, the proportion who were ever assessed as in need. And the same is also true for uh, the 
uh, rate and proportion of children who were ever referred to children's social services. So at least on this level, there's no apparent difference in terms of what happens to children uh, by, by trial arm. And then the third outcome there is uh, looks at um, admissions uh, to hospital as a result of an injury or ingestion experienced by the child in the period of follow up to up, up to age seven years. And um, the, there's a small difference between the two study arms, but really um, not, uh, not um, overwhelming evidence of anything really different going on between the, between the two arms. So, and this is a pattern of results which really uh, was expressed uh, across a range of the um, outcomes that we evaluated uh, in relation to, to maltreatment. Um, um, so for, for that particular domain, there was no real uh, evidence emerging at this stage of, of any key differences. If we look at um, what happens when children get a little bit older and uh, begin school, um, the, there seems to be something more substantial going on. And so the data here relates to the um, early years assessment when children enter, enter school. And we're looking here at uh, the rates of children who in the two study arms who uh, achieve a good level of development, um, either in the, uh, for the five uh, learning areas all, all 17 uh, early learning goals and then the total point score. So three different measures of effectively um, preparedness or readiness for school. Um, if we look at the first two, if you look at uh, all five areas, we can see that there is a, there is a difference in, uh, between the FMP and the usual care arm. So 58% of those in the FMP arm um, are uh, achieving a good level of development um, across all five areas uh, compared to 52% in the user care arm. And this is a difference that is uh, robustly st statistically significant. And the same is also true when you look at all 17 early learning goals. So there's stronger evidence here that there is some advantage for those in the FNP arm compared to the user care arm. When we look at the total point score, this, any differences are really, uh, are, are largely obscured. So there's a, there are, uh, the, 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 the scores are slightly different, but it doesn't reach a level of statistical, statistical significance. And then finally, if we look at what happens when children get a little bit older and are asked to key stage one, uh, what we've, what we've recording here is um, uh, performance in relation to uh, reading, math, science and writing. And, for each of these, there's a, there's a, there's a slight, if not greater, uh, advantage for children in the uh, FMP arm. Um, when we look at the data on, in this table, it's really uh, reading that there is a more of a, there's, there's a greater difference um, being observed. Um, and when we further adjusted for month of birth, uh, because we actually had a disparity in terms of the numbers of children in our sample, according to which month they were born in. Um, when we adjusted for that, which uh, would be, I think, the, the most appropriate way of looking at these data, then we found that the, uh, the difference between uh, the intervention arm and the control arm really firmed up for reading. Um, and uh, so that gives us a reasonable amount of confidence that the program is, is leading to some benefit in that area. Um, we also looked at some subgroup, uh, subgroups and, and again, uh, when we did that uh, uh, for these educational outcomes, we found that there were um, additional advantages for children of younger mothers in terms of early years, early years foundation stage profile um, and key stage one. Uh, outcomes of maths and writing and then also for boys and for children of mothers who are not in employment education and training at baseline in terms of writing so some further benefits for particular subgroups and this final fi figure just summarizes the pattern of uh, outcomes uh, the it, treatment effects um, across the different domains that we assess so at the top you see the maltreatment related outcomes and at the bottom the education developmental outcomes, where there's a bit more of a, a separation between the two study arms. So my final slide really was just uh, you know, maybe some points that people want to pick up in discussion. I think that you know, a question that we have been asked and we ask ourselves is, how does this really fit into the broader evidence base from the US? Um, and therefore, what does this mean for practice? 
Um, there are some methodological issues or challenges of uh, using these data to try and determine um, uh, outcomes such as uh, maltreatment. Um, and uh, we're currently uh, writing something on that at the moment. But, uh, you know, interpreting some of these outcomes, I think, is a bit is, is less straightforward than, than might appear um, uh, on the face of it. And then there are some issues about um, changes over time. So we, we're evaluating now an intervention which was delivered in 2009, 10, 11. Um, program has moved on and I'm sure that others on, on the panel will want to comment on that but of course the the evidence base from the US is even older so I think there are issues about um, how timely or how contemporary it are, are any set of evidence uh, uh, any set of findings um, and then finally you know what does this mean for practice and I think that's what we might find out in discussion later on so um, thank you very much you can find out much more about what we've been doing if you follow this link uh, but for now I'll leave it there thank you Thank you very much, Mike. That was fantastic. Um, really fascinating findings, and I'm sure there'll be a lot for people to discuss. And um, just to remind the attendees, if you've got any um, follow-up factual questions for Mike or Paul after their presentations, please put them in the Q&A, and then anything you want to add to the panel discussion later as well. So over to you, Paul, now, if you could, uh, so Professor Paul Antondani from the University of Cambridge to talk to us about the Healthy Start, Happy Start trial. Thank you, Sal. Um, I'm just going to, as well, try and share my screen. Uh, and if someone could give me a thumbs up, if you can see that. Everyone's gone blank, so I don't know if you can see. You can see it, Paul. It's okay, there. thanks very much. I didn't want to get 10 minutes into a talk and then find that you hadn't. Um, thank you very much. It, I'm delighted to be part of this webinar. It's, it's very nice to join you, and, it, and I'm really delighted that we've got a a chance to discuss and think about early intervention um, because it's been it's been missing from a lot of the conversations over the last couple of years I think uh, certainly not given the prominence that it should have done. Um, I put my email address in the bottom corner here. Um, I'm going to be presenting findings from a study um, which has been published. There's a paper out and a full report and if you want uh, access, they're both freely available online but if you email me I can send you links to them. I thought rather than putting a link in to my talk. Um, I'm the professor of play at Cambridge University, um, but alongside that, I'm also a child psychiatrist. And my talk today is going to be mostly about child mental health and that kind of part of my life. There are overlaps with play. Um, but before I go on to talk about that trial, the Healthy Start, Happy Start trial, I just wanted to let you know a tiny bit about the centre that we have at Cambridge looking at play in education, development and learning. Our tagline is serious research about play, and that's there for a reason, really. We're, we're looking at where play really does fit within the lives of children and very, very importantly, what it can tell us about how we support children right from the start of life. Not just using play, but play is a very important part of that. And if you want any more information about um, the, the, the Pedal Centre, the web address for our, our hub is at the bottom there. That tells you a bit about um, some of the work we do, some blogs and also about other people's work. OK, I'm going to now focus back on early intervention and just think about uh, this particular trial. Um, I'm going to be doing the talking about it, but uh, as Mike alluded to, any trial of this kind is a, is a major enterprise with uh, hundreds or hundreds of people involved. Um, there's funding involved, and these are some of the funders that fund our centre. The particular study I'm talking about today was funded by the National Institute of Health Research, which is the UK government um, funding stream. As with the FNP uh, trial, it's a pragmatic trial, so it's a, a trial conducted in real world practice, and that's very, very important if we're thinking about how we implement or how we take any learnings from this kind of work to implement into practice. This isn't done in a specialist, just some specialist place. This is done by uh, people alongside their regular jobs, health visitors, nursery nurses and others. It also involves an army of people doing it, um, and this is the team at the start in around 2014. Um, both David and I have aged a little bit since then, and maybe him better than me, but um, I'm not going to dwell on that. We're going to talk about early intervention um, and thinking about what you focus on. We're very good, I think, as a field of making the case for early intervention. Um, I, I, think, I think many people are convinced by the argument if you intervene early, not only can you prevent problems, but you can prevent problems that are starting from getting worse and potentially set children on a trajectory. And 
we can make a bigger impact on those trajectories early in life potentially than, than later. But there are real challenges when it comes to the specifics of what that means and what we actually should do. Um, and some of those questions and challenges are, who do we aim our interventions at? You know, should they be universal? Should we be picking off particular groups or looking at particular groups that might benefit, especially like single mothers in the FMP example, um, families experiencing other kinds of difficulties, children with already uh, signals of behavior problems, for example. We need to have effective interventions for that. And that's been a real challenge in translating interventions which look promising into routine practice in the UK. They often seem to stop working when we test them in really pragmatic trials. There are challenges about how we measure things in young children. And then for me, one of the really big challenges, which uh, doesn't get spoken about as much as I think it should, is how we combine what we do interventions over time. You know, we're looking at children developing from naught to two, from naught to five, from naught to 10, large periods of time. And no one intervention is a kind of silver bullet or a magic bullet to solve all, all of life's problems. And multifaceted intervention is gonna be needed. But how do we put together these different bits of evidence from different studies and from our own practice to really figure out what's the best and most effective way of helping different families at different times in their developmental trajectory? So for this particular trial, we were looking at children who had early signs of behavioural difficulties. That was how we identified children who might be at higher risk. The reason we pick behaviour problems is because they emerge early in childhood, they're common, and they're probably the clearest early signal of risk for mental health problems. But also children who develop behavioural problems early are at risk of a whole range of other outcome difficulties, not only uh, mental health problems, but also educational difficulties and later on relationship difficulties and a whole range of other social difficulties. So, um, so it's, a, it's a group of uh, young children who are at risk. They're not all going to get these problems. Obviously, many of them will go on to be fine. But it's a risk marker, if you like, that shows, uh, shows us a group of children who might be at more risk. The other thing that I think is important is, is that the way in which parents interact with their children can be a risk factor but it's also something that can change. There are lots of things that are very challenging for us to change in terms of risks for uh, children's difficulties, but uh, how a parent can uh, care for and look after their child is one thing that can be supported. And finally, early intervention does have the potential to promote better outcomes across life course. We've just struggled a lot, I think, as a field to always be able to demonstrate that and to translate what we kind of know in our practice into evidence that really convincingly can show us what works and who it works for and when it works. So this is the trial that, um, that the team that I work with conducted, which started in around 2014. We called it the Healthy Start, Happy Start trial. Um, we ran it out of Imperial College. It now runs out of uh, University of Cambridge. And the aim was to evaluate the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of a brief early parenting intervention called VIP. And I'll tell you a little bit more about VIP in a moment. And that intervention um, was designed to prevent behavioural problems, prevent enduring behavioural problems in young children. And we were deliberately going very, very early in life. There were a lot of, there's quite a lot of evidence about parenting interventions for children with behavioural difficulties when they're six, seven, eight, nine, there's some even going down to ages of three, some a little bit lower than that, but very, very little, very early in life. So we thought, well, if we're gonna try and get in early and, and try and modify things and support families, let's go really as early as we can. And I know 12 months is a long way in for a lot of people, but in terms of identifying children at risk of behavior problems, 12 months is probably the earliest or around the earliest. We felt we could go at that time. I might make a different decision now because making the same choice. It's a randomised controlled trial, similar to the design that Mike has talked about. Um, it's a smaller trial and a, and a briefer intervention. We recruited 300 families. They were randomised to receive either VIP uh, intervention or treatment as usual. We then followed them up uh, five months after they've been randomised. So the children now are 18 months and upwards. And then we followed them up again at 24 months when the children were three and four. Some of them had just turned five. Um, and I'm going to present data across those two um, follow-up time points. <clears throat> the children and families were recruited from across the south of England. We had quite heavy recruitment across London, but right the way across London, um, from, the, from the west to the far east. Um, also in uh, Hertfordshire and Oxford and in Peterborough. So a fairly wide range of different recruitment sites. 
The intervention itself um, it needs a lot longer to describe, but I'm just going to give you a very brief snapshot. Some of you may know about it already. Um, we selected this intervention because at the time we were thinking about, well, what do you intervene with for behavior problems? The evidence for interventions was probably strongest for this intervention compared to other interventions very, very early in life. It's a very interesting intervention, I think, VIP, video feedback intervention to promote positive parenting and sensitive discipline, not development, sorry, there's a misspelling there. It was developed in the Netherlands and it's underpinned by both attachment theory and social learning theory, which is, I think, what, one of the most interesting things about it. So it has a big focus on parental sensitivity, trying to support parents to respond more sensitively to their infants, to understand what their young children are trying to communicate through cues. But there's also an element of social learning theory. So how do you help parents where children do have difficult aspects of difficult behaviour? How do you help parents to have responses to that? It's a brief, uh, well, brief intervention, six sessions. They're about a fortnight or so apart. And what happens is an intervener goes into the family home and films the child and then some parent-child interaction, takes that away, looks at that very, very carefully and picks out particularly positive moments. And this is one of the things I think is most interesting about this and other related interventions. It's a very, very positively focused intervention, trying to build on what the parent already does well. So the intervener or therapist will go back the next, for the next visit, sit down with the parent and run through that video, giving some commentary, but also encouraging the parent to comment and say, highlighting moments where things are going well and building on those positive moments. And any of you who have one or two year old children know how busy life is, the opportunity, if you can, just to sit and freeze frame and look just slowly at moments of interaction means parents can see things that are almost impossible, I think, to notice in everyday life. It's, it's a way of helping parents to notice things that otherwise would not be very easy to notice for anybody. So that's the intervention in very, very brief. <laughs> Um, we had a lot of measurements, but I'm just going to focus on the top one here. Our main measure was a measure of child behaviour, and that was based on a parental interview. So not just a questionnaire, but detailed questions, getting detailed descriptions from parents and then mapping those descriptions against a standard set of criteria. So it's the interviewer who decides at what point the child scores, not the parent. So in some ways, it's a slightly more robust measure of child behaviour than just a questionnaire, but it as with any measure, it also has its limitations. A range of other measures, um, uh, parent functioning and parent-child interactions using videos. And then at the last follow-up that we've done so far, the two-year follow-up, we're able to look at a range of other child outcomes, including children's executive function. Um, again, a number of different interactions, some gene uh, assays that we're able to do, but also um, we use Dolls House story stems, which allow us to get a bit of a sense of what a child thinks or at least represents. Um, I haven't got time today to show you a video, but most of the families, in most of the families we visited, we were able to do some standard stories. So children are asked to select dolls um, that represent them and their families, and then they're given a series of three or four stories about something happening in the family. It might be you sat around for breakfast and, um, and you knock over some juice. And can you tell us what happens next? So you get a, a bit of an insight into how children think about their families, or at least they represent their families. And then there's obviously a lot of complexity to that, but maybe we can talk about that. Um, there's a whole different presentation on this particular work and what we find in terms of how children view the world and whether that changes with the intervention, which I'm not going to be able to talk about today, but happy to another time. In terms of the actual main study outcome, the primary outcome, if you like, um, which is child behaviour, and um, what you see here is the scores in the video feedback group and the scores in the control group and the scores at baseline and then to the five month follow up. And you see here for the treatment group, there's a drop in the score of uh, on child behavior problems. There's also a drop over time in the control group, but these are different. There's a difference between two groups of two points on the uh, interview. And I'll give you an example just at the end of what that means. Two points could mean a lot, it could mean not very much. Um, but I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment. So a two point, a fairly reliable two point difference. We did a lot of different um, pre-planned analyses. These were all set out in advance, but one I just wanted to highlight because it feels very important to me is we wanted to know, is there an effect in younger children as well as older children? We know that we can do parent type interventions with let's say four, five, six year olds and up, and they can have an effect on children's behavior. What about in the one year olds as well as the two year olds? And what you see over here on the right, this is the score difference. It was two overall 
Um, it's a bit more than two in the one-year-olds and it's a bit under two in the two-year-olds. Now these two numbers probably aren't different in terms of statistical significance, but the, the main takeaway for me is that this intervention seems to work at least as well in the one-year-olds as it do in, does in the two-year-olds. So we can think about this kind of intervention having a potential impact on behavior even in very young children. We then followed the children up across to 24 months. And what you see here is the same pre pack score, the same interview score of child behavior. A baseline, there was, this wasn't a significant difference between the groups. The VIPs group was scoring slightly higher, um, if anything, on behavior, but really these are more or less the same. At the five month follow up, I've showed you this difference. Now you've got the VIP group scoring two points lower. And what we saw is this effect is, is substantially sustained. It drops a tiny bit, but it's more or less sustained until 24 months. So the effect that we see at five month follow-up seems to carry on right the way through to two year follow-up. And this is just showing you in terms of effect size, if we focus on the blue bar, it's an effect size of 0.2, for those of you that might like effect sizes, 0.2 at five months, and it drifts down to 0.17, um, but the, there's not a significant difference between those two numbers. Um, so we have an effect that seems to be sustained. It's largely through effects on children's behavior, conduct, things like tantrums and biting, rather than on children's attention. These are the subscales, but the main take home is the main uh, total score. So what we have is a small but sustained effect of a brief intervention on young children's overall behavior in a pragmatic trial intervention delivered largely by health physicists and nursery nurses in routine practice, or at least alongside their routine practice. There are still some questions about the possible cost effectiveness. It's quite difficult to estimate cost effectiveness for, for very young children, um, but also questions about whether this sustains over the long term, which is clearly very, very important. And I'll just come back to this small but sustained effect. What does a two point difference mean? I can give you just a couple of examples from the questionnaire. So a two point difference would mean the difference between a child having tantrums, which were rated as severe, so they're breaking things, moving from that to tantrums which are counted as mild, so just shouting. So a difference from breaking things to shouting. Or if we think about frequency of tantrums, it's the difference between a parent reporting tantrums daily to once or twice per week. So they're not huge differences, but they're differences which if you're a parent with a child with behavior difficulties, I think are noticeable ones. We're now planning um, a five-year follow-up. We've been funded to follow these children up when they're now seven and eight. It's going to be we're going to be collecting the data in uh, through 2022, but at that point, I hope to be able to share the longer term follow up outcome, whether these effects are sustained, whether it has effects on other children, uh, other function, aspects of children's functioning. But thank you very much for now for your time and attention. Thank you, Paul. That was um, absolutely fascinating as well. Um, and I would really love to follow up with you about the uh, separate presentation about how children see the world. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, so there's been quite a few questions coming through. If I could just remind people, if, you're, if you've got questions, please use the Q&A function um, and don't put them in the chat because they can get a bit lost in the chat. Um, so I'm going to just, um, Mike, if you could switch your camera back on as well, we'll do a couple of the sort of factual follow-up questions around your presentations and then move to the wider panel. Um, so the first one for you, Mike, was a question about, um, did you control for couple relationships or co-parenting in the FMP trial? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, we, we, we didn't stratify it in, in terms of randomization at baseline, uh, but we recorded um, uh, sort of partner status at baseline and, and at the different follow-up points in the trial. Um, so we, we could factor that into to, to the analysis, um, but we largely allowed for there to be sort of natural balance due to the randomization. Um, and of course, um, partnership status uh, can be quite variable uh, for any one family in 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 those in at that age. So um, what we what we saw was quite a lot of difference occurring between baseline and follow up in terms of partner status. Um, we we haven't we probably could do more work going back and looking at that data, but uh, um, but we didn't stratify it for, for it anyway. Okay, thanks, Mike. And um, a process question for you: um, Do you want to know how do you match NHS numbers to the DfE uh, pupil numbers? Um, we didn't. What we did was we um, we provided uh, different identifiers 
identifiers to the Department of Education to allow a linkage. Uh, so this would have been um, child name, parent name, date of birth, postcode, etc. So that's the that's the process that they would normally use to facilitate linkage. But then we also had NHS numbers for all of those families, so that allowed us then to um, create a, a collated data set. Um, and the matching rates were pretty good with DfE. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Paul, just a couple of follow-up questions for you as well. Um, uh, Nicola asked, what's the difference, the main difference between VIP and VIG? <laughs> this is one that comes up a lot. So yeah, um, I'm not an expert on VIG, so um, I can give you my view, but it might be partly wrong. Um, the, the biggest difference I notice is, uh, or I think is the, is the focus. So VIG is very focused on sensitivity primarily, um, and VIP uh, has, the, has a similar uh, focus on parental sensitivity, but also has these very explicit components looking at discipline strategies. So some more directive components trying to help parents think about how to manage behaviour. Um, there are some other differences as well, but for me, that's the, the main one. BIP is more manualised and VIG, I think, is based more around the supervision model. Um, uh, in terms of uh, how it operates, but let's say I'm not, that's, that comes with a large caveat that I'm not an expert on big and other people may well um, be able to provide some other differences. Thanks, Paul. So um, I should just say, uh, again, this is my perspective, but my understanding, the similarities are quite large and people emphasize the differences, but I think there are quite a lot of similarities. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and one last question that we've had quite a number of questions, but I'm keen to move on to the panel discussion. So um, a question about consent and, and um, how many parents consented to their children's being videoed as part of the trial and whether there were any differences in, in who consented to that. Yeah, um, in terms of once people were interested in the trial and were willing to take part, they consented to, to all components of it. There were one or two elements we, we took swabs from, a, from the child and there were a couple of parents that didn't and want that to happen because of uh, concerns about genes and measuring genes. Um, but I think partly because it's an intervention about using video, um, people quite quickly overcome those initial kind of worries that they have about being filmed. Um, and, and very good therapists are very good at helping with that. So we had a very high uptake. We didn't lose anyone just because of the video component. Brilliant, thank you. So um, I'd like to invite the wider panel now, if you could, uh, turn off turn on your videos and join us so we've got uh, Alison Emily Lynn and Tom all joining us alongside um Mike and Paul for the panel and um, I'd like to go to each of you individually just to start with if you could introduce yourselves um, and then just I'm really interested in your reflections on on the presentations and how we really use this evidence to give more children the best start in life um, so maybe Emily if I can go to you first Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that what I wanted to add in terms of some context for the um, discussion and um, after sort of reflecting on the presentations is some of the work we've been doing um, in a big program we've run called The Big Ask, where we were trying to find out the views of children across the country. And we struggled to think, how do we how do we survey not to four year olds? Um, and we spoke and um, worked with Sally to um, do interviews with professionals and parents of young children to understand the impacts of the pandemic and their experiences. Um, it was really, really fascinating. And we've had some really sort of powerful comments from um, parents around um, the experiences of the pandemic on children. And I think given the sort of evidence that we've um, heard from Paul and Mike around um, the importance of, of support, um, early attachment uh, and, and really positive parenting, I think that some of this might provide really interesting context about uh, what, what the pandemic has meant um, for the, in this context. Um, so we heard from a mum of an eight month old that she said she wanted to pause her pregnancy because I'm missing out on all of the stuff that helps me to bond with my, my baby, that really early stuff. Um, we heard from another mum who said um, her baby had found it. He was nine months old when the pandemic started. He's found it really tough. He's not really sociable anymore. Another one who took a baby to a baby group, but he's not allowed to play with the other babies. He crawled over to another baby and didn't really know what to do. He just stared at her. It was really sad. Um, I, can, I can mention some of the other comments uh, later on, so I don't want to um, go through everything, um, but we also heard sort of impact on children's mental health. Um, and I'm talking about um, the impact on the parents' mental health and how you can't just help but have that stress filtered down to the children. I think they saw more than we would ever like to admit. 
Um, we also heard parents talking about what um, what would help for them. Uh, one parent talked about um, used to have, used to have, used to have a children's centre and it was an absolute lifeline with her first. But as far as I know now, none of the others are open. I really feel for new mums who don't have mum friends and things, but I struggle because I know what the life was like before. Um, and then also the, talking about the access to health with visiting, one mum described it as like a roulette. Um, so as a result of um, some of that research, what we've done is um, published a series of policy papers as part of the Big Ask, calling for um, extra support for families, especially with babies in very early age. So we've called for more investment in health visiting, um, but also um, the establishment of more family hubs um, as a network around the country that could bring support together for families. And I think the kind of um, evidence based interventions that Mike and Paul have been talking about it, are exactly the kind of thing that we would like to see available in more areas around the country to provide the support the parents need, particularly as a result of the pandemic. I'll stop there, but I'm really happy to answer any more questions about the big ask if needed. Thank you, Emily. I think we'll touch on that again in the in the wider discussions. Um, if I can go now to um, Alison, if you could introduce yourself and, and give your reflections, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks, Sally. Uh, my name is Alison Morton. I'm the Executive Director at the Institute of Health Visiting. And, and it's just brilliant to hear Mike and Paul's presentations today because I've been following FMP and VIP um, really from the start. And, and actually, it's the long game, isn't it? That's the message to me is actually patience in, in these interventions actually makes a difference. So I, I'm just pulling out some key points for me reflecting on the presentations. One is the value of the upstream preventative public health approach, you know, getting in early when families are risk factors rather than experiencing problems. I think that, you know, the turning off the tap is better than mopping the floor, which we've been talking about a lot recently. Other key points, the intensity of the dose, I think is important, 64 visits. So some would say that's expensive. And I saw a question about that, but actually the cost of getting it wrong is much, much bigger. Um, and actually the impact on these families is huge. Uh, the, the third point is continuity of carer, and there's a highly skilled workforce we're talking about here going into these, these very vulnerable families, uh, but the difference that that makes is enormous, and so we mustn't lose sight of that. So that's about the not just the what we do, but the how we do it and the people that deliver it that's important. Um, I've mentioned that it takes a time to see the effect, uh, so we need to be patient. Uh, the Duchess of Cambridge has said that, you know, we need to be in this for the long game. We have short political cycles and everybody wants a quick answer. Tell me in a year whether it works. Well, you know, barely got off the starting blocks, but I think these two studies show that patients uh, and uh, inter intensive intervention works. And then moving on to VIP, I mean, VIP's fantastic. I love it because it's strengths-based. Um, it's intensive. Uh, Paul always plays down his findings, doesn't he? He said it was small but sustained impact, but we know that for those families, it was massive. You know, actually in the real world, how that pans out for families is huge. Um, it's quite a short duration. So actually, you know, compared to some of these interventions, six, six interventions is small, really. Um, but yeah, just to close, really going forward, I would love it if all vulnerable families had access to intensive support when they need it to make a difference. So it's great to hear these outcomes. So a bit like the Children's Commissioner, we're pushing for investment because it's so, so important to invest in this generation. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Alison. And that is a brilliant point that in the real world, these are massive because, you know, your children not throwing stuff in the tantrum. That's the difference about whether you can feel comfortable going to a play group or not, or having a play. You know, there's, there's all those online sort of repercussions in a real life of the family of what it means to for those small changes that we see on those graphs. And it's great to bring that to life. Um, Lynn, can I pass on to you next to introduce yourself and then and give your reflections? Yeah. Hi. I um, so I'm Lynn Reed, and I am national lead for Family Nurse Partnership and Parenting at the Office for Health Improvement and Disparity that's come into being today. So it's a particular privilege to be part of the panel today um, at this point. Um, in terms of the presentations, which, are, which were great, by the way, I always love listening to Paul and Mike. I think how we use them is in three main ways. First of all, respectfully. And I say that because robust research really matters and it matters because these are the lives of children and thinking about the service provision that can affect their lives, not only in the early years, but across the life course, life course and potentially for the next generation. 
So I think it's really important. And, and I saw, again, one of the questions in the chat about the effects. So really be thoughtful, for instance, what any shift in the dial for vulnerable children means, both for the individual, for the community, and potentially nationally. And certainly, as I've learned a lot from Mike, um, when we are talking about statistical significance, a small percentage is actually really um, huge, actually, when you, when you think of it in those situations. And that's because of the integrity of the research. The other way I think we use this is thoughtfully. As I think, you know, Paul touched on, this is complex, air, this is complex work. And, um, and it's, it's really vital that we explore the findings, dig deep, see underneath, what, what are we not seeing? What, what's it telling us? And, and any research, any excellent research, as Paul and Mike has described, gives us more questions than it provides. And, and that's the, that is, for me, the, this headspace we need to be in collectively about being thoughtful. And finally, but very importantly, collaboratively. I think it's really important that we work together. Um, and, when I, and when I say we, um, I think across the system. So certainly with academic colleagues, with um, policy colleagues, co colleagues like yourself, Sally and others, and Alison and organisations. Um, in, importantly, that we work across the system with local stakeholders, commissioners, providers, practice, and most importantly, with families and children. And I really loved um, certainly what Paul attempts to, to hear what children are saying. It's really important. And certainly some, some of the work that we're developing around both of FMP and the wider um, agenda, a very big focus for us is listening to the voices and the lived experience. And, and I think before I close, is there's something about the potential about a public health approach to this, because it really matters, um, as Alison said. So that I, I think, you know, there's huge potential and it's really important, the work that Mike and Paul have led here. Thank you, Lynn. And we're really excited that you're back in the Department for Health now, able to, to sow those seeds and influence from within there. And um, last but by no means least, Tom, can we uh, hear your reflections on this? Yeah, absolutely. Afternoon all. I'm Tom O'Bride. I'm the Director of Evidence at the Early Intervention Foundation. So really, really fascinating um, presentations, but studies I know reasonably well. Um, I guess we'll get into the discussion. One of the things I always reflect on is in the latest FMP trial is you've got really rigorous evidence on improving a set of educational cognitive outcomes over the long term on outcomes which are really quite difficult to shift, actually. I think that's a really positive finding. I guess to contrast with that with the fact that what we don't see is a difference between the two groups and involvement of children's social care. Um, and that's not because incidence is low across the two groups, it's actually quite high. Being eligible for FMP is really quite a strong predictor of involvement in children's social care in your child's life. So we, we know with a good degree of certainty some of the families who are likely to re require a social work involvement, but we haven't got an intervention at the minute which is good enough for supporting them. To, to avoid that. I think that you know, raises some questions about well, the structural issues that uh, sit around that and are we doing enough in those areas. I mean, just thinking about how we use this, this evidence going forward, I think lots of, lots of great examples within both these presentations of what we need to see more of, um, particularly the long-term follow-up. I think you know, we look at dozens and dozens of interventions in the early years and normally they measure an effect immediately after the intervention is finished, maybe they do six months follow-up. Tracking children over, over the long term is, is crucial. Um, we've got good data in the National Pupil Database and so on, as just in, and, and other admin data sources. Being, making better use of that, I think is crucial and great that we're doing it. I sort of think that if we're doing trials in the early years, we should just standardly think we should track these children through, through NPD and NDP. NPD um, and understand the impact that that has on, on educational outcomes. I mean, just a couple of other thoughts. 
um, you know, as somebody who's worked in the civil service who continues to work quite, quite closely with, with central government, I always think it's it's most easy to get politicians and senior civil servants interested if you've got quite a hard and crunchy outcome measure. You know, we can all agree on the importance of emotional self-regulation or executive function, but you know, having something like a speech and language outcome is something that most likely to, to engage senior, senior civil servants and politicians, in my experience. So I think we need to think a bit about that. And yeah, Paul stole, stole one of my points a little bit about the point on silver, silver bullets. I think we can often... You know, articulate a sort of naive narrative that as long as we get it right in the first 10 years that will be fine for, forever and let's let's remember that a lot of the families who are the recipients of these interventions have highly complex needs um, and you know, we can't assume but you know, there, there's very little reason to think there's going to be silver bullets out there that are going to put children on the right trajectory for life um, especially if they're sort of low intensity and brief interventions that's not to say they can't help but they're probably not going to be uh, sufficient Thanks, Tom. Lots to think about there. Um, my brain is sort of overflowing with all of this. Um, I'm interested in the, the the question you made about uh, the point you made about the sort of crunchy outcome measures, and um, you know we have politicians who who are very focused on education and social care, and therefore being able to show the um, show the impact on those things is obviously very powerful for them. But we do know that uh, early relationships, emotional regulation are very predictive of a lot of life outcomes. And I wonder how we win hearts and minds about the importance of those measures as well. I don't know if any of the panel have any thoughts on that, or do we just need to keep measuring the crunchy things? I can offer a brief, I mean, I don't think it has to be either or, does it? You know, um, like it is possible to measure both. It's possible with NPD to measure educational outcomes relatively cheaply and simply, you know. So if we think that, you know, this intervention, any intervention is likely to lead to improvements in educational performance or, or, or cognitive outcomes, then we should try and measure it. I mean, we've got to keep making the case, but, you know, we also have to remember politicians are not experts in child development or education and it is just easier to make the link between speech and language development and educational outcomes than it is between emotional self-regulation and educational outcomes and yeah we, we must continue to make the case but i think we need to re recognize the reality of, of the level of understanding that, that we are dealing with as well thanks tom so we heard today about two um quite intensive interventions in terms and um, you know uh, in terms of uh, the time and the number of visits um, that professionals offer to families um, and yet as Emily alluded to we're in a context of post-pandemic a lot of services being pulled back and um, a lot of things being delivered virtually and you know as Alison well knows um, health system numbers being decimated in lots of areas and a pull towards a kind of uh, cheaper less skilled workforce and I, I'm interested in you as the panel's kind of uh, thoughts about um, how we balance that and obviously one, one um, way of doing that is to say well we target particular interventions at families at high risk and think of, of um, uh, lower skilled cheaper interventions for other families but and you know how do we even know and understand risk if we don't have that, that early intervention so I'm interested in your thoughts about how we get this balance between affordable interventions and uh, getting the right support to the right people at the right time, which might mean more intervent more expensive, more inten intensive interventions. Please do just unmute yourself and share your thoughts. Um, I'm happy to go, Sally. Um, and I think Michael Marmot's work is the place where I would go for this question, uh, because actually he's shown uh, proportionate universalism is, is the way forward. Um, if we only target services to those um, families who have problems, uh, there's all sorts of flaws in that because actually we know that um, disadvantage and, and inequalities exist across the whole spectrum, every indice of multiple deprivation, we will have families in there with, with additional needs who need additional support. There's also a lot of stigma, isn't there? If you are selected because of some virtue that you have or deficit that you have, then, then um, you know, people very quickly in communities know, well, if that children's centre, that's where all the problem families go. And, uh, you know, that, that's, um, 
you know, a black mark against your name if you have to go there. Whereas I think the beauty of Universal is everybody has a universal service. So that the family hubs, I'm excited by the family hubs because I think they, they offer a huge opportunity where families can walk in and get everything from a stay and play, uh, breastfeeding support all the way through to intensive support for domestic abuse all in one place. Um, and picking up on your um, comment about skills, I mean, I think we mustn't lose sight of actually that the value of FMP was the highly skilled workforce. Uh, and there's a lot of research that says um, it might seem cost effective to use a cheaper workforce, uh, but these are safety critical professionals and they have a high level of skill and, and um, you don't get the same outcomes with somebody uh, who doesn't have that level of skill. Um, of course, skill mix has, has a value. Um, so we want to work in teams which are skill mixed, but, but I think that you can't beat a highly skilled professional uh, leading um, this work with these families. Thanks, Alison. Do any of the other panel have any thoughts on that? I could come in and just completely agree with Alison on the point of proportionate universalism, but I think we do have to get much better at tracking data, uh, using data to track where children are falling behind on their developmental goals and then um, doing something about it. So our research in our Better Beginnings report found that um, we aren't very good at looking at uh, taking the sort of um, two, and two to two and a half year old check, identifying the children there who are falling behind and then making sure that those children are, uh, are provided with additional support and tracked um, until they well until and beyond when they start school and I think that would help us both make sure that the children who need it get the right intervention but that we're also building the evidence base to make the case for the cost effectiveness of the interventions and um, so you know adding to um, what Paul was saying at the end of his presentation about the need to demonstrate cost effectiveness I think that's just so key in terms of trying to get the treasury to recognize that and value all of the um, interventions that we're talking about and recognize the skilled professionals and I think we now have the tools to do that we have the NPD we have the NHS number we have ways of, of being able to identify children and, tra and track them we just need we need to make that much much more across the board I recognize though that the challenges that we have so the other thing that we found in our report was the huge variation in caseloads for health visitors we had some with over sort of 800 children on their caseload and you know it, it, that that's a challenge that really needs to be addressed and again that's why we're calling for further investment in the area Thanks, Emily, because of course there's a sort of catch to too. If you haven't got the services working, then you're not getting that data for the tracking. So in areas like where I live, where the ASQ is just sent to parents by the post, but then that is the data on which you're tracking children's outcomes, you've already, you're not going to detect the, the children who need the more intensive intervention. So I think, yeah, making that case to help us for identifying and understanding what's going on in our population as well as intervening is going to be really important. I wonder if anybody else has any thoughts on the panel about the issue of, of skills and skills mix. Um, and Paul, were there any thoughts when doing the trial about which professionals offered VIP um, and, and who, who you would Yeah, with yeah. It? I, but just a couple of thoughts. Are, I mean, they, they, they're, they're two quite different interventions. I think that's worth stressing. And, and FMP clearly is a, is a very specialist health visitor, as I understand it anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, those of you that know it better, but it's a highly specialist kind of, of role. With VIP, the, the intervention in our trial was delivered, to say, mostly by health visitors and nursery nurses. It was, there were, there were, there was a mental health team who trained in it, and there were some other psychologists and some trainee psychologists as well. So we ended up with it being delivered by quite a wide range of professionals. Um, I haven't got I haven't got kind of hardcore randomized evidence for what predicted outcome, but just based on our experience of people who people who had a degree of kind of uh, experience of working with children and families, which I think was critical, but who were open to learning new skills and able to take on new things and deal with the discomfort of learning something new and challenging, I think was for me the biggest predictor. Um, rather than what level or what professional group they were from, there were some in all of those groups who did it brilliantly, and there were some within all of those groups who struggled. Um, in other trials, it's been delivered by master's level students with uh, different levels of ex experience. So uh, I think with the right training and the right support, it can be delivered by quite a wide range of, of professionals. Uh, it'd be really interesting to figure out whether there's a difference depending on who we are able to do that, but it'd be really interesting to know. Yeah, and I, one of our um, one of the questions that's been asked is about um, kind of whether volunteers, so sort of home start volunteers, or whether this might deliver some of these things as well. If, we, if they have the same characteristics, I don't see why why not. I, I think 
it's, it's difficult to be really definite about this based on uh, my experience of it. But I think if people have a certain level of experience of working with children and families and familiarity so they can establish a relationship of trust and then are able to learn those new skills, then uh, I, I say that could apply. That could apply to some of those people for sure. If I, if I, if I can add, in, in the context of um, our evaluations of FMP, uh, you've got the the skill sets and the experience of the, the nurses who have been delivering the specialist intervention. But I think that as important, well, equally important is the fact that you've got a, a structure behind that. Um, you have fidelity targets, you have a whole system that is supporting, I mean, supervising and supporting the work of those practitioners. And I mean, Alison, I think, made the point about continuity of care. What we observed was that in the trial period, even, even in the trial period, um, there, there was some turnover of uh, family nurses um, and any one family may have actually uh, been visited by more than one, maybe more than two nurses over the course of two and a half years. But you've got continuity, you've got systemic continuity provided by the local team. I think that's really important. And in terms of skills, yes, there are there specially recruited and trained and, and supervised within that very definitive model. But then I think Lynn can probably tell you a little bit about what they've been doing to share the learning from that, sharing that practice with the, the other um, professionals that they're working with alongside. So I think there's a great, there's a great motivation to sort of take the, what's good about FMP and then um, allow that to sort of live beyond the, the, the boundaries of FMP. Thanks, Mike. Lynn, I think you're keen to contribute, so over to you. Yeah, just, I, I mean, adding a, a few points that um, around the quality of implementation, um, which I think is key, um, different interventions clearly, I think, should and would have evaluated the different sorts of um, practitioner who are, who are best placed to deliver the individual intervention. And I think that's really important. Um, and beyond that, the, as Mike said, it is a structure that supports continuous quality of, of implementation and improvement um, in, in the, as, as we go forward. So I think that's really important. Um, and, and, and as Mike said, yeah, I mean, one of the learnings from the delivery of FMP in England, so we have adapted a manualised programme um, to um, deliver a very personalised level of care. And I think, you know, I think there is something that probably it would be interesting to unpack within this sphere of parenting interventions, that a manualised programme actually is really flexible. It's, it, you know, certainly um, it's around the therapeutic relationship um, in FMP's case between the nurse and the parent. That, that is the two. Um, so there's some not flexibility, but certainly um, I think I just wanted to, so a wrong in quality of implementation, ongoing data-driven quality improvement. And I think a real deep respect for the workforce. We have, I think, an amazing um, early years in this case, but I think, you know, an amazing workforce across health and social care in the voluntary sector. So I personally, um, I'm really interested as we work collaboratively to think together how we um, leverage um, the, the potential of this fantastic workforce we've got and really lucky to have. Thanks Lynn and that links into some of the, the questions we've had about how um, the people delivering these interventions can link up with the wider workforce and share some of those skills and insights and learnings about way of working and perhaps model those. And I wondered if you had any examples from FMP of where that's working really well in terms of FMP driving a kind of change in the wider system for families beyond those who get the intervention. Yeah, and, and I think again, the words respect and collaboration are key. So um, what we have, and um, I can see some people from the audience as well, we've, we've developed packages of knowledge and skills exchange based on the evidence and learning from FMP and they are delivered in collaboration with 
colleagues from local systems, be they health visitors, social workers, early years practitioners. So there's mutual learning and, and we've always had really good feedback from that. Um, and also, um, we've also got areas where um, the supervision model um, is adapted and FM within. So for instance, some family nurses are, are supporting locally with supervision. I think that's really important. Supervision matters and that's what we know. Um, and then I think that also there's, in, there's some systems in the country where they're working with local systems to, for instance, develop a vulnerable parents pathway with, I think, you know, with FMP as an anchor um, for the most vulnerable, um, as, as, as local systems are working to really meet the needs of their population. And I think that's, that I, I guess is a key factor for me. What are the needs of the population? What's the data telling uh, us? And I, I know from, um, working with various systems that there's some excellent work being undertaken with as with into within integrated care systems as as as, as that with that emergent work that i think is certainly something to build on and i think it's really positive um for this area of work thanks lynn um alison i think you want to contribute on mute. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sally. Yes, uh, I was just picking up on what Lynn was saying about um, kind of the learning across the system. And I think that's the thing that really speaks out for me. And I'm really delighted that uh, PHE or OHID are going to be exploring this because um, I think the learning that's come out of this for me is we're talking about two separate things. So VIP is an intensive six week program. And then on the other hand, we've got FMP, which is actually an infrastructure of support, a bit like health visiting. Um, and actually, it's really important that the ingredients that we put in that infrastructure are going to deliver the outcomes that we want. That sounds really simplistic, doesn't it? But, but actually, it's about relationships. So we need our infrastructures built around relationships because we know that the families who need the help the most are the ones with the least agency to reach out and ask for help and I think that safety net that we keep talking about around families um, where we reach in rather than expecting them to pick up the phone I think so powerful particularly for the most vulnerable and I think that's the strength of FMP it is the relationships if I was if there was one headline message I think that's the key ingredient that works on both of these programs um, above everything else so yeah I, I, that was kind of my main point but I guess the other point picking back on the data question um, the other thing I like about FMP and the ADAPT program was the, um, the, the recognition that we live in a messy real world where it's all complex and actually RCTs give us one lens to look at outcomes but actually um, if you talk to a parent and you say what was the thing that was life-changing you know, I remember when I was head of nursing in Hampshire, a young mum said to me, well, it was actually, I'd fallen out with my own mother and the family nurse helped me to build that relationship. I mean, that doesn't appear on a tick box, uh, but actually that was life changing for that, that young mother. Um, so we need to have much more nuance, much more sophistication, uh, multiple perspectives, co-production. You talked about that, Lynn. But I think we're all talking the same language, but it's exciting. So I'm interested in your thoughts about uh, some of the enablers or barriers to this good practice being available more widely. Um, so we've obviously just had a reshuffle in cabinet. If you had your moment with the Secretary of State or uh, with Rishi Sunak ahead of the spending review, what are the things that you think government should be doing right now to enable this evidence-based practice, either these interventions or others for, for young children to be rolled out and to create those whole systems where families are getting the right support at the right time? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think we, we've we sort of been clear that we think that, that this, the sort of network of family hubs should be it, it sort, of, uh, sort of rolled out and established more widely and that we should have um, other services built around that so that it's very easy for families to know where to go if they need any support and help and that becomes a kind of real hub help in, in the community that people are aware of and able to use. We've also called for a doubling of the Supporting Families programme as well, because I think the outcomes framework there allows for um, sort of developing of a robust evidence of what, what works for, um, and will help, help um, sort of 
help us assess um, that 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 we're, what we're doing is what is working for children um, from looking at the early years development goals. But I also I also think um, I think Jean Gross mentioned it in the day, in the chat. I think it's really important that we are able to data share better so that we can track children's outcomes um, right from the early years and then track that track that into um, their education outcomes and their health outcomes later on. And I think that's something that will be, be really key key in the future to being able being able to kind of get the investment that we want in this area. Thank you, Lee. And do you, have you articulated your vision for what family hubs do? Because I think there's quite a lot of concern in the system that this is a sort of 0 to 19 model. It's very, it's not clear about what the components of that are, whether it includes anything for the 0 to 5 at all and what that looks like and definitely how it enables kind of high quality provision. Are you doing anything to kind of articulate a family, what a family hub actually does for for young children yes i won't go into it in a huge amount of detail here and um, because we don't have the time but if you have a look on our website we've set out a sort of policy paper which goes into a lot more detail about what we think family hubs should include and what support we think is needed for local areas to provide family hubs so we talked about um sort of expanding the family hubs transformation fund providing ongoing ongoing resources to run the centers and um, doing it through a bid approach but with additional support so that local authorities know what they need to be doing to provide it. And um, so, yeah, I just recommend that people have a look on our website and then they're able to see a bit more of the detail about what we're calling for. Thank you. Any other thoughts around kind of the policy that can make this sort of practice happen? Paul? I'm not a policy expert, but I'm just gonna throw a couple of thoughts in. I'm gonna nick um, Mike's trial name as well, because I think building blocks is a really helpful analogy. Um, and if we're thinking about what we do for the young children and families in our country, one of the things I'd plea for is some sustained long-term thinking and planning, um, because that seems to be missing substantially. <laughs> and the changes that we go through and the changes that we go through through every political cycle are really unhelpful. Um, and investing in the youngest people in, in our society is such an important thing for the long-term health of our society. That's become, you know, it's always apparent, but these things become more apparent when you go through crises, don't they? Um, so that sustained that sustained building over a long period of time and long term thought. And the other is that, 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 that we that we have to do some tough thinking about how we piece all this together and different elements will come in and come out, whether we're talking about interventions or particular staffing constellations. As we develop new knowledge, we'll, 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 we do learn different things. Um, so I, there's, there, we don't we don't win if we all go for this is the intervention we all have to do. This is the intervention we all have to do. And there's a there is a tendency in our field, and I'm part of the field, so I'm not criticising from the outside. I'm sitting from very much in the middle of it. We do have a tendency to have our favourites, um, and of course we have to be tough and robust and test things and be very very clear when they we seem to work or not work and do the things that seem to work. But we need a constellation of different elements. Um, in our in our provision, different interventions and different um, groupings to, to make it work again for the long term. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Mike, you have your hand up. Is anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I suppose just a thought from the perspective of a researcher here. Um, it has, I mean, in reality, it's been quite difficult to sustain the funding that's allowed us to do this evaluation over a long period of time. And I think that in many ways, the the government were um, initially to commission the trial I was very impressive um, and but it only took us to 24 months post-birth and we then had to sort of look for an opportunity for some additional funding to take us beyond that and uh, as Lynn knows I'm still I'm now thinking about the even longer term perspective so um, to some extent, and you, I think I can't remember who mentioned it, but you know, the, po the political perspective can be quite short term, and um, I think that what we have demonstrated is that we can use routinely collected data effectively to look at the longer term um, impact of such programs. Uh, I mean, just, just reiterating the point that Tom made, actually, and it's still not easy to do, uh, but. Um, there are developments and a, and a motivation politically to make that more common. And um, so this should be routinized, I think, where it, where, we, where, we, where it can be to allow us to do um, evaluations at lower cost um, and provide more timely evidence. And one of the problems I think that, that certainly Lynn and, and, and 
and her team have experienced over, over many years is the fact that we can only generate evidence as we're going along and that will never tell us a full story about what's going on for these families. Um, so, um, and that's been problematic in terms of how services have been commissioned at a local level, you know, come completely aware of that. And, um, and I think that as researchers, what we need to be doing is, is continuing to have sort of good, close communication conversations with, with policy and practice um, to where we can give them a heads up on, on, on what's next on, on our horizon. So I think as researchers, we should be looking to do more to support policy in this area too. Thanks, Mike. I mean, I think it feels really obvious listening to you and thinking about the trials, the kind of IFS stuff around Sure Start that that interventions need to be trapped for a long time and actually you know benefits do accumulate and we can see things later that we don't see early on but there was obviously that tension there if what you said you know what the, how do we provide timely evidence when you have to track things for a number of years and by the time you find the evidence the system has changed and i think what's quite heartbreaking working in this area at the moment is this evidence is coming through for things that have already been decommissioned and how do we kind of create that patience that we've talked about to hold on to stuff until the evidence comes through um so, so yeah, lots to lots to think about. Lots of challenges there, but so many opportunities. And you're right; this all should be kind of standard of, of you know part of commissioning early interventions of, of, of building in that tracking. Um, Paul talked about a, a kind of constellation of different services, and one of the questions is around um, children who are uh, neurodivergent, so children with um, who are autistic or with ADHD, and, and how we find the right interventions for for those. And I guess there's lots of other groups of children who might need these interventions to be tailored for them or a different sort of intervention. And I wonder if you have any thoughts, panel, about um, a kind of an inclusive offer or how interventions are tailored for different groups, different needs. Len? I, I think that's a really good question. and. Um, and respecting the um, the the question about um, neurodiversities, I think it's really important and emerging. I think and overall about inclusion and, and diversity is something that I think that as a as a group of work sh should and needs to be starting to be embedded at the outset. I think. Um, and I think a lot of that thinking, because it's quite emergent, you know, uh, thank goodness. Um, and a, a lot of that, I wonder, as we really focus together on the voice of co-design, the voice of, of family, of parents, the voice of children, I'm, I'm really hoping that that, is, that holds us to account for um, making sure that interventions that are offered, that are developed, are inclusive and um, recognising um, that individuals, um, you know, we're a diverse society and any service offer needs to reflect the diversity society. So I think that's something that's crucial across a range of factors um, so that we're providing that um, provision for, that's acceptable to all. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Emily, there's a couple of questions to find out more about what you were saying around the um, Children's Commission of Family Hub work. So maybe if you've got a link for that, you could put it in the chat and we'll also disseminate it. I think people would find that really helpful. Um, we are um, coming to the end of our time together. Um, so I would just like to say a huge thank you um, to uh, Mike and Paul and all of the panel. Um, there's so much here. Um, the, the trials obviously provide such rich information and they do really help us to make the case for why intervening between conception and two and beyond really matters. But they also, as people have reflected, kind of raise as many questions as they answer in terms of interventions, but also in terms of how we create this kind of complex constellation of systems and services that make sure the families get the support they need. And I, um, I, I really love the themes in Lynn's kind of presentation earlier about we need to move forward respectfully and thoughtfully and collaboratively and I look forward to doing that with all of you to try and you know improve the services available to all of our babies and make sure that this evidence is not just informing the rollout of 
particular interventions, although it must do that, but also creating that whole system change. Thank you very much to everybody who um, dialed in to watch this as a webinar. We will be sharing the link so you can watch it again or share it with colleagues. Um, and please do get in touch. And if you're interested in more of these sort of discussions, subscribe to the First Thousand One Days email list as well. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye bye. Oh, bye.